I hold a book in my hand this morning. It's God's Word. It's the Bible. And contained in this book are God's laws. 617 to be exact. Commandments of God. They fall into two classifications. 248 are mandatory. Those are things that I have to do. And 365 are prohibitory, things that I shouldn't do, that I should stay away from, that I should leave out of my life. Now, I know it's probably not a good way to start a sermon, because some of you got very tense when I started talking about that. But I've come to the realization that I can't keep the law, and neither can you. But I want to bring you good news this morning because of Jesus Christ who came to fulfill the law. That he took our, our sins upon himself. He went to the cross and he died for you and I. His sacrifice paid for the sin that we would commit past, present, and future. And by grace, we've been saved. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 read like this. But because of his great love for us, God who... Is rich in mercy has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our own trespasses. It's by grace you've been saved. And God has done all this for you and I, and it's been done freely. But I have to ask you a question this morning. God has done all life for that for us. What does He require of you and me? What does God want from me? What does God want from you? There was a Reader's Digest article back in 2009, just before President Obama was about to take office. It was titled, Memo to the President. And in this, uh, this article, they asked 18 prominent leaders to offer him some advice. They asked 18 statesmen and women spanning a political spectrum to offer some wisdom and counsel to the incoming president. They asked about health finance, and leadership, and environment, education, and religion. Reverend Billy Graham, who's advised presidents since Harry Truman, had a quote from a prophet in the Old Testament. When they asked him, this is what he said. He, he, he quoted the prophet Micah, and he said, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And this morning, I want to invite you uh, to look at with me the prophet Micah to understand what God's requirements are. What does God want and require from you and me? It really sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It's almost like a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout motto, you know? Be fair, be nice, be humble. But when you study the prophet who spoke these words and when you understand the context in which he spoke them, their impact, on, and on, their impact on those who heard them, you realize it was more than just a motto. To understand Micah, we first place him in the context of the history of the people of he, the Hebrew people. We know that Abraham was a father of many nations. God had made so many promises to him. And then there's Moses and his encounter with Pharaoh. The Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt, making bricks and starving. When God called Moses to the mountaintop <clears throat> and spoke to him from the burning bush, God sent Moses back to Pharaoh with one message, let my people go. And most of you know the rest of the story. God, through Moses' leadership, led the people out of bondage and eventually into the promised land. God established a covenant with the Hebrew people, and this is what it was. I will be your God, and you will be my people. God freed the Hebrew people and led them into the promised land. It was only the first of many, many ways God upheld his part of the covenant. He promised to continue to provide for them. Now, covenant is an agreement between two parties. It's a relationship uh, agreement. Both parties have responsibilities, required behaviors that sustain and maintain a relationship. 
Contract, on the other hand, is also an agreement between two people, but a contact, contract is usually drawn up because of distrust. I'm not sure you're going to fulfill your part of it, so we're going to draw this contract up, and if you don't, then this is how I'm going to benefit from it. But it's not like that with God. He said to them, I will be your God, and you will be my people. The Hebrew people had requirements. One of them was, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy 6, 5. But then a few verses later, in verse 12 of that chapter in Deuteronomy, there's kind of a be careful reminder that's given to the people. And it said, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And again and again, we see through history that they forgot their God. Micah was a prophet during one of those times and periods of history where the Hebrew people had forgot about God. Things were going well economically and politically, but they had forgotten their covenant with God. The rich and the powerful were using their influence to exploit the vulnerable, creating greater inequalities of wealth and influence. Micah taught and was a prophet in a culture characterized by idolatry, immorality, and outright rebellion against worshiping God. And he was very vocal in his demands for justice for the poor and the downtrodden. He spoke out against corrupt judges, priests, and business owners. Micah was known for bringing a message of judgment and restoration that would spur a revival in the land of Judah. Micah boldly proclaimed that certain things were required of those who follow and believe in the Lord. God requires that we live differently than those around us. And we need to be very careful, just as the Hebrew people fell away from doing what God wanted them to do. This could happen to us. And Micah answers the question in the text today, what does God require of you? Chapter 6 in the book of Micah opens up almost like a courtroom scene in which God's people are standing trial before their creator for turning away from him and their treatment of others. In verses uh, 1 through 5 of chapter 6, it says, Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the indictment of the Lord. And you enduring the foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. I, I sent uh, before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised. What Balaam, the son of Ben-Nor, answered him. And what happened to, from uh, Shittim to Gigal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So we see that the Lord has an indictment against his people. And he lays it out very clearly here. And he says to him, what have I done? You know, and then he reminds him of what he's done. He delivered them. He brought them out of slavery and bondage. And so then after that, Micah launches into, what does God require of you? Verse 6 and 7, it says, What shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, a calves, uh, a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall, my, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And so God says, what are you going to bring? What can you bring that would make up for your sin? Verse 6 in the first part, it says, you know, should I bow? How do I approach God? Now, we know from Scripture that there's a lot of ways that people would come before God. Some would bow, some would sit, some would kneel, some would stand, some would, would, would lay prostrate. It's not the physical position that we're in, but it's really the position of our heart. 
And we're reminded to love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our spirit. And then the second part of verse 6 into 7 says, And what shall I bring in my possessions? What could I offer God? Should I come with an armful of offerings, burnt offerings, a calf, a year old, thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, my firstborn, what shall I bring for my transgressions and to cancel my sin? And we know that there's nothing that we could bring or offer to God that would be satisfying for our sin. Only Jesus could provide that. Again, when it comes to the matter of the heart, Psalm 51 is a chapter that David has written when finally he comes to a place where he's confronted with the sin in his life and he realizes what he's actually done and it really hits him full on. He writes chapter 51. Verse 17 of that chapter says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will never despise. He reached a place where his sin had so overwhelmed him that the only thing that he could bring to God was his broken spirit and his contrite heart. A contrite heart or spirit is when a person's inner person or will has been broken so they no longer run after the things that they want. A broken heart or will says, I will no longer do things on my terms, but I will surrender it to you in your ways. It's a heart fully surrendered to God. And it says, God will never turn that away. See, we have this love relationship with the Lord. He loves us, and we need to love him back. I don't need to work or labor to find God's favor. So what does the Lord want from, from me? What can I do, or what can I bring to God? It's a question I suspect maybe you've asked at different times. God, what do you want from me? Not that we, we could do nothing to repay God, but God, what do you want out of my life? And so we want to look at that today. And I think that if you're sitting here this morning, you'd probably say, well, I definitely want God's will in my life. When it comes down to it, what does the Lord require of us? We find in the next verse three things. Verse 8 tells us, it says, <clears throat> He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Three things that really present a framework that we can hang the teachings of the Lord on. We heard it this morning in the Beatitudes that we come with God and we give God all of ourself that he says he'll bless us and be with us. What is to act justly? It's to do what's right, whether it's favorable or not. There are plenty of injustices in our world. We live in a culture that social justice is a big word. And people are out standing up for social justice and sometimes they're totally misinformed or they're just going about it the wrong way. But injustice in the Bible is most often associated with the strong opposing the weak and taking them for all they have, taking their possessions, their freedoms, and their reputation. God is a God who acts justly on the behalf of the oppressed. He's attentive to the cries of the oppressed. God cares deeply for those who have no voice of their own. Psalm 35, 10 says, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him? And we see over and over a reoccurring theme that he rescues the poor. To act justly is that we would defend those who are oppressed and afflicted. It's to take a wrong and make it right. Billy Graham says, never overlook those who cannot care for themselves and those who live under constant threat of disease, starvation, poverty, and tyranny. The practice of justice will most often bring me into conflict with my oppressor, and it takes courage to do that, as well as an act of devotion to God. I think there's a story in, in the New Testament in John chapter 8 that I think really puts this in perspective. It's the woman that's caught in the act of adultery. Maybe we're familiar with this story. 
So they, they set it up. This woman is caught in the act of adultery. And they bring her to Jesus and they say to him, you know, what should we do with her? Now, Jesus is in a little bit of a dilemma because there's two ways he can answer. And seemingly, whatever way he answers is going to be wrong. He could say, let her go. And they would say, you're not fulfilling the law. Or he could say, stone her. And they would say to him, you're not being merciful. Jesus looks at them and says to them, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. What an answer. Man, I wish I could give answers like that. It would just stop people dead in their tracks, you know? And we see from that story that slowly people drop their stones and walk away because Jesus put it on them, you know? Yeah, this woman stands before me condemned, and I know what the law says, and I know it's supposed to happen. But he forgives her, and he challenges her to go and live a life worthy of being forgiven. Jesus acted justly. Just, justice in Hebrew is a, well, I'll just tell you, I don't know Hebrew this morning, okay? I know shalom and bar mitzvah and a couple of words like that, but I don't know Hebrew. But the Hebrew word is misfat, okay? It's a prominent word in the Old Testament. It's to make sure everyone gets what they deserve. It's to be just. The late Tim Keller says misfat, its most basic meaning is to treat people equitably, it means acquiring or punishing every person on the merits of the case, regardless of race or social status. Anyone who does the same wrong should be guilty of the same penalty. But it means more than just uh, punishment of doing wrong. It also means giving people their rights. It's giving people what they're due, whether it's punishment, protection, or care. That's what it is to be just. And not only do we do what's right, but we're challenged to do it in a merciful way. The second part of that verse says to love mercy, to love kindness. Mercy or kindness is unfailing love. It's tenderness, it's faithfulness. And it's the Hebrew word hesed. It's not merely an emotion or a feeling, but it involves action on behalf of someone in need. This word is used 250 times in the Old Testament. It expresses an essential part of God's character. It communicates loyalty or faithfulness to his people. The act of hestis is always performed freely under no obligation or fear of reprisal. It intervenes on the behalf of others and comes to the rescue. It's a relationship term. It's not a warm, fuzzy kind of feeling. Compassion, it's compassionate, it's up close and personal. I think the story that captures this is a parable that Jesus gives when he talks about loving mercy. The parable is found in Luke chapter 10, and the story starts out that there's a, a lawyer comes to test Jesus. And he says to him, how do I obtain eternal life and Jesus says to love God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself and the scriptures say he wanted to justify himself so he asked Jesus another question he said who's my neighbor and Jesus goes into this parable about this man that's on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho it's a very dangerous way it's a well known way for trouble and the man is robbed and beaten and left for dead. And the first person that comes by is a priest. And the story in the parable says that he passed on the other side. And then a Levite came, also a religious leader. And he did the same. He passed. And then the Samaritan came. And he threw him some canned goods and some gospel tracts. And he told him that the urgent care was two blocks down on the right. No. Story is that he went. He probably tore his own clothes to make bandages. And he cleaned this man's wounds. He took care of him. 
and that he went into his wallet and he provided for him that he would have lodging so he could recover. He crosses the street and gets involved. To love mercy is when the help of others is essential, when that person cannot help themselves. Without help, the person's situation will turn drastically worse. It's like you're in big trouble and something really bad is gonna happen to you and someone helps you. They have no reason to, but they go out of their way to help and assist you. There's nothing in it for me, I just do it. And it's not just to show kindness or mercy, but it's to love doing it. There's a difference. I can show somebody mercy, but if I'm not loving what I'm doing, then I'm really not doing it in the right attitude. I wanna give you some pointers this morning on um, what it is to be merciful. It's to be patient with people's quirks. You know any quirky people? (laughs) Help anyone around who's hurting. Give people a second chance. Do good to those who hurt you. Be kind to those who offended you. Build bridges of love to the unpopular. It's not something that we just do, but we have to love doing it. And finally, Micah says to walk humbly with your God. Now, you notice how the first two deal in our relationships with others, but then this third one deals in our relationship with God. And I really believe if we have the relationship with God that we should, that the other two are gonna fall into place. But, these, but there's a deep inner relationship between all three. To walk humbly with your God, it's our will being conformed to his will. The Bible tells us, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. It says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We're not to allow that perpendicular pronoun to raise its ugly head, the big I, to get in the way. Pride is one of the greatest hindrances in receiving God's blessing. It's loving God that we come to love and care for those created in God's image. Again, quoting Billy, Billy Graham, You can't truly walk with God if you allow pride and ego to dominate you. Humility moves us away from arrogance and from uh, egocentric behavior where we need to be always first or right or better than others or knowing it all. Intimacy with God should lead us to an imitation of his character. The person who hears God's voice is the one who humbly seeks it. The Apostle Paul in some of his letters that he opened in the New Testament, he said, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Paul was a very qualified man, educated, religious. But when he came to Christ, he realized that he really was nothing. All his education and all his experience and all who he was didn't matter anymore. So he says, I'm a bondservant of Christ. And what he was saying is, I've given up my rights. The only right I have is to do the will of Jesus. As I humble myself before God, I put him in the right place in my life. It's a place of dependency and intimacy. I begin to share his passions, caring deeply for what he cares about. I begin to take on the nature of my heavenly father. Lori Cunningham, who was, is the founder of Youth with a Mission, says to allow our hearts to be broken by the things that break the heart of God. And Jesus modeled intense dependency and intimacy with his heavenly father. We see that throughout his ministry. A matter of fact, in his inaugural address in Luke chapter four, the first time that Jesus would, after his temptation, speak publicly, He actually gave a kind of a reinstatement of Micah 4, and this is what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so we see that not only are we encouraged 
in the book of Micah, but Jesus in his ministry. So what does God require of you and I? It's to do justly, to love mercy and kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I have a story this morning. It's a true story, and I think it captures what I'm talking about this morning. It took place in the mid-'70s down in Florida. There was a young boy. His name was Chris Carter. He was 10 years old. He was kidnapped and molested and taken to the Florida Everglades and shot in the head and left for dead. This young boy wanted to live. He dragged himself out to the road and they found him and he recovered. The crime went unsolved. Through many years of counseling and therapy and prayers of his Christian parents, he grew up and became a young man. He had a daily reminder of what had happened to him. I'm sure there was nightmares that went along with that and everything that would follow that. But he had a daily reminder. See, when the bullet exited, it went through his eye and he lost sight in his eye. So every time he looked in the mirror, he was reminded of what happened to him. He grew up, graduated high school, went to college, got a job, married, had a family, bought a house, just going on with life. But I'm sure he wondered at times, why did this happen to me? What's the purpose? What's the meaning? This, this case went on south for 20 years. And it wasn't because of an uh, investigation. It was because there was a, da a, a man named David McAllister who was 77 years old in a nursing home dying of cancer. And he wanted to confess to a crime he had committed many years before. He confessed to that crime. And the police con contacted uh, Chris Carter and said to him, do you want to press charges? And he said, no, I'd like to meet the man. So he went and met him. And his purpose in going to meet the man was to shake hands with his assailant and to tell him of the transformation that had happened in his life through Christ as a result of what happened to him. He wanted to offer him forgiveness for his sins. He introduced him to Jesus. The man was dying. He had no family, no friends. And so this young man, 32 years old, decided that he was going to embrace him as family. He took his own family there to meet him. And he stuck with him until he passed away. What does God require of you and me? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And Jesus is our ultimate example of this, knowing that divine justice needed, uh, was demanded as payment for the penalty of our sin. Even though he himself had never sinned, he went to the cross willingly for you and I to do justly. And from the cross, we see how he loved mercy. We know that physically what Jesus endured before he went to the cross and finally they drove spikes in his hands and feet and they placed him in the ground. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We see all throughout his ministry that he walked humbly with his father. On the night he was betrayed and arrested, the night of his greatest need, we find Jesus on his knees, washing his disciples' feet, setting an example for us to follow. What does the Lord require of you and me? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God.
Regina came up this morning and she presented an opportunity that we could actually do that. You, you, you may be sitting here and saying, well, what am I supposed to do? Take a baby bottle. Support the ministry. But see it more than just supporting the ministry. You could be saving a life. A life that has no voice. You could be, your giving could provide the services that are needed so a child can be born. So a mother and a father wouldn't have to deal with guilt the rest of their life. See more than that. We had an announcement this morning about supporting the homeless shelter with Access Church. It's to get involved with that. Opportunities. At the end of the month on the 28th, we have a, a deaf event here. Be able to get behind that. It's to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There's people sitting here this morning. They could be sitting right next to you. And maybe they need a little mercy. Maybe they need to see God living through you and I. So the challenge is there. We can't do anything to make up for our sin. It's been covered. The price has been paid. It's paid in full. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. Jesus paid it for you and I. That's a settled issue. But what does God want from us? How do we live our life? We live our life to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning for your great faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, as we look back and we look at our own lives, we can see your hand of favor and blessing upon us. Thank you for the work of the cross that we can be completely forgiven and stand uh, in righteousness in you. But Lord, I pray that we will be challenged this morning to live a life that's worthy of the price that it cost you. And Lord, I pray as we look to you and we humble ourselves before you, God, that you would give us opportunities. Lord, that we could reach out to others and we could show them how good you are. And so, Lord, I'm asking you that you would live through us. Bless your people. May we continue to know your favor and blessings. And God, so we can share it with those around us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.